Hello and welcome back. Today we will be continuing our Victoria 3 tutorial series and we are going to be talking about which laws are best in the economy section of the laws. Uh, for this video we're going to be very quickly going through which laws I think are best. Then we will be discussing background ideas for unpacking which ones are best. There are two kind of important ideas. And then we will be going through each one of these law categories at a time and discussing in a kind of more broken down one uh, the various trade-offs you experience for each of these laws. Now very quickly uh, for economic system, I think that laissez-faire is best in the early game, and then in the very late game, cooperative ownership is best. Uh, for trade policy, I think that free trade is best. Uh, for taxation, I think that graduated taxation is best, with a heavy asterisk. Uh, for land reform, I think that uh, in the early game, commercialized agriculture is best, and collective ag agriculture will be best in the late game. Uh, for colonization, I think colonial exploitation is going to be best, unless you have an enormous population, at which point resettlement becomes best. Um, uh, for policing, I think that dedicated police is best. Uh, for education system, I think that public schools is best, uh, but barely beats out religious schools. Uh, and then for uh, health system, I think that public health insurance is best, uh, and that it's not particularly close. So there are going to be two ideas that are really important for understanding and making sense of a lot of the decisions we make in terms of which laws are best in the economy tab. And the first one we're going to be discussing is how you extract wealth from the country. Now, this is not really kind of what we're trying to talk about in terms of balance, but anytime you're running a positive balance, you're depressing the economy uh, because you are extracting money from it. And anytime you're running a negative balance, you're stimulating the economy because you're overspending. When you depress the economy, generally this drives down prices slightly uh, and businesses will be less profitable. And when you are, you know, stimulating the economy, uh, which is often not sustainable, uh, you will be driving prices up in a general sense for, due to a variety of reasons. Because if you, if you add a bunch of construction and you increase the price of steel a whole bunch, uh, like let's say come in here, uh, this steel will have a higher weekly balance because of the construction. But then this higher balance is going to uh, give more demand for consumer goods and so it'll drive up all prices. And so when we're thinking about this, we want to, generally speaking, extract as much money as possible and then re-inject the money as efficiently as possible or uh, decide not to extract because we're trying to increase SOL or various other conditions, but generally increasing SOL, which has a variety of positive factors. Now, in a general sense, what we want to do is we want to often extract as much wealth as possible from the upper strata and try and avoid extracting wealth from the lower strata as much as possible. And the reason for this has nothing to do with social justice. It has to do with the wealth of the lower strata has better returns on investment for increasing SOL, which is a positive thing, uh, than the increased, uh, you know, or the more wealth for the upper strata. And the reason for this is exponential needs. And so in order to kind of break this down, we're just gonna need to briefly look at needs. And so we're gonna jump into kind of the tab here, uh, and we're gonna talk about the different types of needs very quickly. Um, so there's temporary needs which you only need up to a certain wealth level uh, and th after that point they will either decrease or suddenly disappear. Uh, so we have like basic food, simple clothing, etc, etc. There's constant needs which appear, they increase with wealth, and then they stay at the same amount. And then there's exponential needs. And the exponential needs are the really important key one to understand here for understanding why we want to take money from the rich pops as much as possible. When the rich uh, get to a certain standard of living, here, let's kind of come in here, uh, you will see the graph where their needs will increase in a way that is non-linear. Which means that in order to go up from 23 to 25, for example, it's going to require more wealth than from 21 to 23 because the amount of, of these goods that you are going to require for each wealth level will increase higher and higher and higher in a non-linear way. And so when pops are, you know, at this 43 and going up to 45, it'll take them a ton of wealth to increase. And so what ends up happening is if we in particular, jumping back into the game real quick, if we are taxing these guys, we will not decrease their SOL by as much as when we tax these guys because the amount of money that it took to bring them up to the level they had before is going to be much, much greater relative to their total wealth level. I'll repeat that in case I said it wrong the first time. The amount of money it's going to take for these guys to increase their standard of living by one uh, increases, which means that if we extract money from them, we are going to be able to extract a higher percentage from them before we decrease their SOL because the marginal amount to take it took to bring them up to their current SOL level from the previous one is higher 
relative to the total amount of wealth that they have. And so we don't want to extract money from the lower strata in general. Um, okay, so this is kind of the first big one is that we would prefer to tax the upper strata. Now, often, especially if you have a ton of peasants, you kind of just full throttle it anyways, extract as much wealth as possible because construction is really valuable when you have a lot of peasants. And so if extracting wealth from the lower strata is gonna give you significantly more money, then you'll do it. But once you reach the point where you don't have a lot of peasants, it's really, really nice to try and pump the SOL and go after you know just the rich pops as much as possible. Okay, the next key idea we need to talk about is investment pool and ownership. We see here that farmers and shopkeepers, when they are the owners of the building, will contribute 5% of their dividends of their overall uh, income into the investment pool. Aristocrats will contribute 10% and capitalists will contribute 20%. Now, the owners of the buildings will, generally speaking, be extraordinarily rich, which means you want to extract as much money as possible from them, which means that capitalists are gonna be the best uh, ones to extract as much money from because they will be in the upper strata. And so the capitalist investment pool contribution is generally going to be the most useful because they will be contributing 20% of this weekly balance to the investment pool. And this is a form of, a billing, uh, uh, of extracting wealth from them. However, there is a modifier, an important modifier to be aware of, which is that there is a malice that uh, is subjected to this. Uh, once you hit 2 billion, the malice will be at max and it starts becoming a malice at 10 million GDP. And what this does is it creates a multiplier that the investment pool is multiplied by. Uh, we will see here that all investments are multiplied by 0.3. And once this malice becomes sufficiently large, it becomes a problem because this means that money is being effectively lit on fire because the capitalists will be contributing 20% of their dividends to the invest investment pool, but only 70% of that fund will uh, reach there. Instead, you know, or sorry, 30%, instead 70% gets lit on fire. And so what this means is that we're effectively lighting 14% of the dividends of the capitalist owned buildings on fire. Now there's a kind of key break point, and I think it happens, I think it's at the high 800 million GDP, it's like 863 or 869, something like that, where you, uh, the the malice becomes sufficiently large or the multiplier becomes sufficiently small uh, that this money will be negative even through the bonuses uh, and the two bonuses we're talking about here are going to be the laissez-faire bonus which gives 25 percent investment pool contribution efficiency and it's important to note how these uh, bonuses work the way that these bonuses work is that they do not increase the amount of money extra extracted from the capitalists. The capitalists always give 20%. Instead, it increases the amount of money that reaches the investment pool. And so instead of 20% uh, percent reaching the investment pool, 25% will reach the investment pool. 20, only 20% 20 gets extracted from the capitalists. That extra 5% from 20 plus the five, that is free money modifier. And so as long as you're under 800 million GDP, you will be getting further than just getting to extract wealth from the pops you are preferring to extract money from, the upper strata, because you care about exponential needs. Beyond that, you will be extracting money uh, in a way that uh, gives you free money, effectively speaking. And so, even, even past 800 million GDP though, getting the money in your hands so that you can reinvest it in efficient ways, it's still going to be particularly strong, uh, but you know, 900, a billion, 1.1 billion, stuff like this, eventually the capitalists do fall off. But we'll talk about that more in just a minute as we get into the specific laws that can matter. All right, so let's talk about economic system. now. Before we get into this, I just wanted to point out or mention uh, that I have an extremely long video on why laissez-faire is better than interventionism. All of the concepts still apply, but laissez-faire does now also give an additional max number of company. And so if you wanted kind of something that's extremely in depth on unpacking a lot of the ideas that are present in considering some of these things, we do have that. It will be in the description below or in a pinned comment. Now getting into it, we have traditionalism here, which is extremely bad, but it's just kind of the starting place for a lot of countries. It's not like a legitimate choice. It's just a starting off point. And in here we have 25% uh, private construction allocation. And it's important to understand that currently 1.5.12 or 1.5.13, I forget exactly which one we're on, this is bugged. The way this normally operates is this is going to be the ceiling at which of how much, uh, what percentage uh, can be picked up by the private queue. 
and most people think that this is a negative modifier this is actually a positive modifier because it allows you to make better use of the investment pool and fully drain the investment pool and so we actually prefer to have a bigger private construction allocation this is really explained in a lot of depth in the interventionism versus laissez-faire video uh, but this being low is actually a negative factor uh, we have private uh, we have uh, minus market access price impact, which is tremendously bad. This was introduced in 1.5, and this will absolutely crush the profitability of your buildings unless they are built uh, with kind of local economies cont entirely contained within a single state. Uh, the taxation capacity and the bureaucracy, it's kind of a little bit of a wash, but it is something to consider, especially if you're a high pop country, swapping off of traditionalism will cause you to run a bureau bureaucratic deficit, so this is important to keep in mind. And here we see uh, kind of several things going on. The subsidies are not too, too important uh, a, a consideration because mechanically speaking, it doesn't make much sense to subsidize, especially now that trade uh, is disaffected or is negatively affected by MAPI. But we have here this negative contribution efficiency on aristocrats, capitalists, and shopkeepers, everyone but farmers. This is really bad because the capitalists, remember, 20% of their income is taken from them uh, and given to the investment pool, but this modifier doesn't change how much that's taken from them. So they're still getting 20% taken, but only 10% will reach the investment pool. This is really, really a bad, bad law, uh, and there's not much reason to stay on it. Instead, it's just kind of a starting off law. And this is kind of how I look at interventionism. A lot of people, I think, are of the impression that interventionism should just be as good as laissez-faire, but there should be some sort of trade-off and that they should be balanced in this way. No, this is not how I look at it. I look at interventionism as being a starting point law uh, that is going to have uh, you know, none of these malices, 50% private uh, construction allocation. It's very vanilla. It's very basic, as it were. Um, you know, it's your, it's your, yeah, it's your very basic law, uh, but interventionism is going to be, uh, uh, is going to be, in my opinion, kind of a starting point law where countries start with it, but you would never actually want to intentionally go interventionism over something much, much better like laissez-faire. Agrarianism, uh, currently, uh, this law could maybe make sense and is really strong on Qing specifically. Uh, if you have a ton of subsistence farms and it's going to be a huge share of your investment pool contribution for a while because it gives plus 50% investment pool contribution efficiency. Now, just to keep in mind, this isn't like as much a reason to specifically go for, uh, you know, aristocratic ownership because remember, their base contribution is 10%. Right, so when you get 10% plus the 50%, you're getting a 5% free money modifier, right? That's how, uh, but that's only giving an additional 5% of the dividend to the investment pool. It's the equivalent of if it was 25% on capitalist investment pool contribution efficiency because it's modifying a, uh, a much smaller base number. The capitalist investment pool contribution efficiency, if we have a contribution of 20% base on the capitalists and we do plus 25% on that, 25% of 20 is 5. So it'll be 25% that hits the investment pool. If we think the same way with the aristocrats, the base value is 10%. And so if we do plus 50% on that 10%, it's going to be an additional 5%. So it's the same amount of additional money hitting the investment pool relative to the dividends. Um, but currently, the AI doesn't build up anywhere near enough for agrarian uh, to be that viable. Um, but I do think, in particular, it's worth noting that Qing, because they have so many subsistence farms at the start of the game, and it's going to be such a large percentage of your investment pool contribution for so long, that it, it's actually worth it to go agrarianism first. And also, going agrarianism is much easier. Next up is industry banned. An industry banned is a meme. Uh, this law is absolutely terrible. Uh, it's no good. Um, I mean, minus stand expected standard of living is kind of a nice modifier, but this minus 25 protection uh, research speed and minus 25% uh, technology for uh, spread for production, these modifiers are very, very bad, especially the research speed, because there's no way to overcome that. Um, you know, in terms of your active research, you will always be slowed down on this. And this is like a very, very negative modifier. We do get a little bit of extra throughput from for our troubles, but what this does is it disables a whole bunch of PMs as well. You can't build any heavy industry buildings, um, which or uh, you cannot use heavy industry uh, uh, PMs. So, so I think this is, I'm not even sure what all this eliminates, but I believe you can't build like 
Uh, you might not be able to build engines, you might not be able to build steel. I am not even 100% because we haven't experimented with this too much because it's just a meme. It gives extra aristocrats investment pool contribution efficiency. Um, you can build power plants, um, but you uh, there's going to be a whole bunch of PMs. I think specifically labor-saving PMs you can't use a lot of, especially if the labor-saving PM like uses engines or coal or stuff like this. I think this is a lot of what it disallows, um, but... I'm not even 100% sure because this is this is just a meme law. Okay, next up is laissez-faire, which is going to be the very best early game, and it's going to have a lot of really good things going on. So plus one max number of companies. That's really hard to quantify. It's extremely good, um, and it's important to realize between laissez-faire and cooperative ownership. If you already have six companies, which is the absolute max with laissez-faire, and you've already gone macroeconomics, and you swap to cooperative ownership, as we have done here, you will actually be able to keep the sixth company. If we slot out one of these companies here, we will not be able to slot in a new company. We have exactly six companies, and we could kind of just show this really quick here. Let's slot out, uh, or let's disband this one, and we will see, hey, we do not get a new one to put up. So this is kind of just a weird interaction that, that I think is worth noting as we talk about laissez-faire but in the early game laissez-faire is going to be really good it has more private construction allocation than interventionism so just just on that alone more uh private uh, allocation it already looks better however interventionism lets you downsize buildings you cannot downsize buildings in laissez-faire you generally don't want to downsize buildings but this can be good especially uh late game where you want to downsize your agriculture in order to build it all up for throughput bonuses but moving on which is to say, if we have 35 arable land, we want it all on the same thing. That way we can have 34% throughput instead of on a bunch of different things. Throughput from economies of scale. Minus loan interest rate. This is an incredibly strong modifier, especially, uh, you know, uh, if you are a great power, this will effectively reduces the interest rate of your loans by like 50% because you're already getting a minus 50% modifier from being a GP. So if you have minus 50% and then get an additional minus 25% on it, you're only paying 25%. And so this will dramatically increase the value of deficit spending you could subsidize uh infrastructure and trade centers uh and it uh it disallows the downsizing of non-government buildings so this is kind of the big drawback uh, but you get 25 percent extra capitalist investment pool contribution efficiency and there's no malice to the efficiency of uh the aristocrats and so this one will be really really good however as you go really really late into the game what you will have is you will have a bunch of stuff owned by capitalists. Um, and you would prefer that it doesn't get owned by capitalists because of this modifier here, which is annihilating, you know, 70% of that dividends. And so what you want to do late game, as this malice really builds up and as you get, you know, a GDP around a billion, you want to swap to cooperative ownership. Because what cooperative ownership does, it does give extra uh, investment contribution efficiency, which is kind of nice. It lets you downsize buildings. It gives 35% private construction allocation, which, okay, is not good as good as 75 under laissez-faire. But what it does is it changes the ownership of all the buildings. We are at cooperative ownership here. And so if we look here, we can see that we have workers' cooperatives, which are now owned by shopkeepers. Recall, shopkeepers only contribute five percent of their investment pool to the or of their dividends to the investment pool, and so that means that if we were under capitalists and they're twenty percent, seventy percent of that is getting annihilated. That's fourteen percent of the overall dividends getting annihilated. If we cut that, you know, by seventy-five percent, because we now have an ownership of shopkeepers who only contribute 5% to the investment pool, well then a lot less money is getting annihilated. And instead, what these guys will do is they will take this weekly balance and they will spend it on stuff like clothing. Uh, they will also generally get pretty rich and spend it on luxury goods and this type of stuff. And so instead the money gets to spin in your economy and provide value because when we buy clothes, this will drive up the price of the clothes and the textile mills, which will positively affect the weekly balance. And so late game, you want to not annihilate money. And so it's better to swift, uh, switch to workers cooperative because a smaller percentage of money is getting sent to the investment pool and being subjected to this malice here of the just annihilating money. Now, late game, command economy, 
suffers from not being available until it's already bad. I think if you're maybe below 400 million GDP, command economy can be good. Uh, and what command economy does is it gives ownership, there's no investment pool, uh, and it gives all ownership to the state. The, you, what you will get is you will get a state, uh, the state will own the building, and so all the dividends, whether they're positive or negative, will be what the state receives. And so at first this sounds really good because this means you're just extracting 100% of the money, right? Uh, th that means all the dividend, all of this goes to you, uh, which looks really good. It gives you a ton of control. It allows you to really ramp up construction. But the problem is, is this malice, not only does it apply to the dividend, uh, but it's going to apply where the absolute, uh, you know, ceiling of this malice or floor of this malice, however you want to look at it, is actually 0 0.2 instead of 0 0.3. And so it will be annihilating 80% of the money. Uh, and so, and not only this, you can think of it like instead of, you know, capitalists, 20% is being contributed to the investment pool or shopkeepers, 5%. We have a hundred percent contribution to the investment pool, so a lot of money really gets annihilated under this law. On top of you can't deficit spend with this law; that's a no-no. Um, but uh, that's not really the biggest consideration, considering how much control and power it gives you. So this law can feel really, really good if you don't have like four hundred million GDP. Uh, but otherwise, it really just starts annihilating a ton of money. It also gives the authority; that's not really the big deal. Uh, but command economy is just not that good um, unless you have really low GDP. And if you ever play with command economy and you have a really low GDP, it will feel fantastic. But I think that for the most part, by the time you can put in command economy, because it does require, um, you know, a, a pretty late tech, I think, I'm not even 100% sure, but I think it does require uh, down here, I think it requires central planning in order to unlock it, it does, uh, which is a tier four tech. I think you should be at a GDP that it will no longer be good by the time you can go in. And so that means that kind of with our thinking is when you know you can get a positive uh, contribution, you want uh, these guys to contribute as much as possible. Um, and so you want to go laissez-faire and go and lean into capitalist ownership. And then once you know your GDP starts getting around 900 million, then a switch to command economy, just from an economy base, or sorry, cooperative ownership, just from an economy base is gonna be better. One thing that is kind of annoying about going cooperative ownership is that you will get a bunch of malices with other countries um, for purposes of like doing customs you use of these types of things where okay we have other problems here but the we have incompatible economic systems so this will break your customs union economically and so sometimes the value of your customs union is higher than you know this trade-off into cooperative ownership um, but that's just another little thing to keep in mind and so it's going to be laissez-faire is going to be best early and then cooperative ownership later again we will post in either the comments or uh, or in either the comments or the description the really long explanation as to why laissez-faire is way better than interventionism um it's even got the extra company all right, next up is trade policy, which shouldn't take too long. Um, generally speaking, the way you actually want to tariff is you want to not tariff at all. It is generally more worth creating buy and sell orders in your country. And so if you are exporting something, you want to prioritize export. And if you're importing something, you want to prioritize import. And if you do this, you actually don't collect a tariff. Um, mercantilism and protectionism both allow for a kind of different tariffing amount, but since you don't really want to collect a tariff in terms of best practice, uh, you don't really want to do this anyways. Now there's maybe something to be said about uh, certain multiplayer strategies around dumping goods uh, to people's economy in order to make it so that you get to be the guy who builds wood, for example, but I think that uh, the mappy, how mappy negatively affects trade makes such a strategy not too viable, and so you don't I think need to really think about this too much. Uh, and so you can view mercantilism and protectionism as being somewhat similar with one key difference. Uh, the trade, the actual trade building itself under mercantilism, let's find a trade center. The trade center itself under mercantilism will be owned by the merchant guilds and under the other one, it will be privately owned by the capitalist under protectionism, which means that the dividends you are going to have a better situation um, with the dividends in terms of the reinvestment. And so protectionism is preferable to mercantilism 
for this reason, for this ownership reason, unless you have a really big GDP, in which case mercantilism would be better, but better than both of these is going to be free trade, which is giving you trade route volume and minus bureaucracy cost and extra trade route competitiveness. And since you don't want to tariff anyways, it's just going to be considerably better. Uh, if you get to the point where you are like the world's market though, it can make sense to go back to isolationism, especially if you've already kind of finished all the tech you want. You get a tech spread malice, which if you're super rich, that's not really that important anyways. A little bit extra taxation capacity, minus declared interest. If you're huge, this won't matter anyways. Uh, but you get 50% authority for your efforts, uh, but you can't trade anymore. Which is, again, not a problem if you're the world's market. But free trade is going to be the best in most circumstances. All right, so let's talk about taxes. Uh, first up is consumption-based taxation, which only has consumption tax. Every single one of these laws has the exact same consumption tax. And so this is kind of like no taxes. And in return, you get a minus bureaucracy population cost multiplier. Uh, you don't usually go consumption-based taxation except as a means of passing a different tax law. Uh, next up, we have a land-based taxation. Now, this has a land tax and an income tax, only 10% on the income tax, and the land tax takes money from the peasants. So it's taking money from a lower strata type pop. However, um, if you are playing someone like Ching, you actually probably want to stay on land-based taxation for a while longer because you have so many peasants, and this will allow you to crank up a whole bunch of construction. And with that construction, you know, you can de-peasant pops faster than if you were to get a really early switch on the per capita or proportional. And so some countries, very, very small numbers, you want to stay on land-based taxation for a hot minute. But next up we have per capita taxation. Now per capita taxation, you still have a land tax, it's a little bit smaller, 0.5, and now you have a per capita tax and a higher income tax rate. Income tax rate proportionally will affect everyone the same, but per capita tax is going to be regressive in that it is charging every pop, you know, one ducat for all non-peasant pops. And what this does is, uh, you know, in terms of a proportion of their income, this is going to target lower rung pops much, much harder and is going to hurt them a lot more. But at the flip side, you get to get more money and so you will get to build more. And so just evaluating the law by itself, it's going to be better than land-based taxation. However, as a result of interest group considerations, you usually never want to go per capita taxation and it's generally kind of considered to be a bad law. And the reason being is there will be armed forces, I think petite bourgeoisie, there will be a lot of interest groups who are willing to swap from land-based taxation to proportional taxation. However, only the trade unionists who become power much in power much, much later into the game, only they will be willing to swap from per capita taxation to proportional taxation. So because of swapping off of per capita to proportional is so difficult, generally speaking, you wanna stay on land-based and then swap to proportional. And if you are a country that starts on per capita taxation, often you actually want to move back to land-based taxation so that you can enact proportional taxation. Sometimes the very rare circumstance where you can't pass land-based taxation when you're on per capita and you wanna go prop tax, you sometimes go back to consumption-based taxation. So from there, you can go on to proportional taxation. Now, proportional taxation is not going to be regressive. Uh, it is going to just target an income tax rate and then also a dividends tax rate. And this dividends tax is going to be really nice in that it is targeting the pops you want to target. And so, you know, you can like, um, uh, Put up the tax slider or it's not a slider but this up and down to adjust how much money you're making uh, and try and pass the tax law that is going to target uh, the strata that you value taxing the most and so sometimes you will have a situation where you are on land-based taxation proportional taxation makes less money but making the swap makes sense because it's targeting the people you want to target more and so you swap to proportional taxation and then you increase the taxes more uh, to make up for you know kind of your overall budgetary concern and this can make sense. Uh, finally, we have graduated taxation which has a much lower income tax rate and a much higher dividends tax rate. This will very often, uh, unless you are on uh, a uh, unless you are on, I think if you are on um, cooperative ownership, this won't always be the case, but very often graduated taxation will not make as much money as proportional taxation. Proportional taxation, 30% income tax rate, 15% dividends. This is only increasing the dividends tax rate by 10%, uh, but is decreasing the income tax rate by 12.5%. And so, 
um, you know, this will, you have to have pops having really, really high dividends, but in particular for this to be better. However, this targets the upper rung strata a bit better. And so if you enact graduated taxation, this is going to mean less taxes for the middle and lower strata. And this reduced taxes is going to allow them to have higher SOL, which has a variety of other positive effects. And so it is for this reason uh, that I think graduated taxation is better. Now, if you have a ton of peasants, I think graduated taxation is bad. You should just try and make as much money as possible to build out those peasants. But once you start having not so many peasants, graduated taxation starts to look like the best because it increases SOL, which allows for better birth rate and more migration, or generally better birth rate. It depends on where the SOL is. Uh, and for this reason, I think graduate is the best. It's often the hardest to switch to though. And so very often you will have land-based taxation or swap to it, swap to pro prop tax for majority of the game. And that's kind of how it often will shake out. All right, next up we have land reform. And very important to note, serfdom will block the better uh, you know, laws under economic system. And so serfdom, a lot of places will start on it. It is catastrophically bad. It also gives extra nobility and it also makes it so that your pops don't quite, uh, it changes up PMs in a couple spots. That's not really the biggest consideration. The really important one is you can't swap off to a better economic system. And so often you will wanna get off of serfdom as much as possible. Uh, early on, tenant farmers and homesteading will be available to you. Uh, for a while I was thinking homesteading was better, but I think that this overall just ends up making uh, the peasants too powerful or the land or uh, yeah, it makes it ends up making the rural folk a little bit too powerful in a lot of situations uh, going homesteading and I've started to prefer tenant farmers also notable the homesteading will give you homesteading ownership on your buildings all right and the tenant farms will give you aristocratic ownership the aristocrats contribute uh 10 percent here we have homesteading where it's going to be peasant or more, more farmer ownership in addition to some aristocrats you will get a five percent investment pool contribution from the farmers and 10 percent from the aristocrats this on top of making the rural folk too powerful sometimes um just generally speaking uh if you want the rural folk powerful homesteading can be good if you don't want the rural folk powerful and they can oppose a lot of laws you like i think tenant farmers is better and on tenant farmers you can still often completely destroy the clout of the landowners or in our case the civic nobility uh, and so this is a little bit less of a consideration and so early game i kind of have started to prefer tenant farmers unless we're trying to lean into the rural sp folk specifically now, even later, you get commercialized agriculture, which allows you to change the ownership of your buildings to being, uh, you know, owned partially by capitalists, which are going to have the best investment pool contribution. And also, you notice that this disables trade unions will no longer attract lower strata. This disables trade unions will no longer uh, attract lower strata. This is not the case with commercialized agriculture. The trade unions is very often an interest group you are particularly uh, want to have a bit of a come up in. And the fact that you can attract the trade unions in commercialized agriculture is gonna be very valuable because you want that group to become powerful very often or to demarginalize entirely. And so this is one of the bigger reasons we like commercialized agriculture on top of it changing the ownership from being one that is going to be either capitalist or peasant owned, or sorry, either aristocrat or peasant owned under homesteading or privately owned to publicly traded, uh, which is gonna be a bit better. Finally, you will get workers' cooperatives. We gotta actually swap these onto workers' cooperatives, which is actually why uh, our rural folk is so weak right now um, in, the, in this run. Uh, but uh, yeah, and we wanna swap it onto that. But. Uh, what we will have here is going to be, uh, oops, that's the wrong one. Uh, late game, co collectivized agriculture. If you already have cooperative ownership, I think collectivized agriculture will be better because it's gonna have the ownership be, or yeah, it's gonna have the ownership be, uh, or allow for the ownership to be workers cooperative or government run. I actually don't have a super strong opinion on if government runs better. I think this gives government shares and these government shares, actually I do have a strong opinion. These government shares are subjected to the enormous malice. And so it actually would be strongly preferable. Uh, it's subjected to this type of malice uh, for those money to go to peasants instead. So we actually made a mistake this run, not swapping all these um, on over to being uh, workers cooperatives, but okay. 
oof, mistakes were made. Um, but that's going to be, uh, you know, kind of the land reform. It's super late game. Uh, the least amount of money will get flushed down the toilet once you go collectivize agriculture. And then early game, uh, you will be getting, you know, positive modifiers. This malice won't be so big. And with the uh, happy industrialist, you know, you will be getting job creators for extra investment pool contribution efficiency. You will probably also be on laissez-faire for another 25%. And so things will be good. All right, next up, we're gonna talk about colonization. Um, no colonial affairs will be good if you can't afford the bureaucracy or you can't afford the time to pass the law. Um, frontier colonization is an interesting one. It gives you plus 50% migration attraction in unincorporated states, which is basically what you get with colonial resettlement. The only reason to go frontier colonization over this is because more interest groups will support it or there will be greater interest group support. So you could do this for an approval basis, but you need to be adjacent to a place in order to colonize under frontier colonization and this is generally really bad and so for that reason i think colonial resettlement is going to be better than that however colonial resettlement this migration attraction this is a pretty strong modifier maybe there's a really good way to game it maybe this is actually colonial resettlement is going to be better for something like usa uh for the migration attraction uh because you are getting such so much flat modifier from the unused arable land this plus the 50 percent i think colonial resettlement makes a lot of sense with the usa and just intentionally not incorporating states uh but if we are going to be uh for most countries i think colonial exploitation is better i also think resettlement will tend to be better with really hard live large pop countries that will often have unemployment like Qing or uh, you know the East India Company or this type of thing uh, because uh, you can you know pull your pops from uh, places that are incorporated and experiencing unemployment uh, to these new lands that you have just conquered or what have you um, and this is going to be pretty nice uh, for the migration attraction for the most part though I think colonial exploitation is best it does have this tension some of these tension decays minus starting wages minus subsistence output uh, you know, minus manufacturing industries throughput in incorporated, unincorporated states. This is kind of an important modifier to consider because it's a negative one, but it's going to give you plantations throughput, mines throughput, forestries throughput, and rubber plantations throughput. Um, I think that in general, uh, overall, this is going to be a positive thing. And very often, uh, what ends up happening is we kind of, as an incorporation strategy, incorporate most everything except for kind of these African states. And these African states will provide rubber. And throughput is really, really good when you don't have a lot of levels in something. And you can see here, uh, you know, we would only have 21 throughput from economies of scale, but we're getting some throughput from a company. And then we're also getting uh, throughput from colonial exploitation, which is going to allow us to have a lot more rubber, which is actually something we have a shortage of here. And so uh, I think colonial exploitation is generally going to be better for most runs, but maybe something like a new world country that doesn't have all incorporated states like the USA or something like Qing, which has a lot of pops it wants to send out from its kind of mainland states, uh, will prefer something like colonial resettlement. All right, next up we have policing. Now, if you can't afford the institution, no police can make some sense. Um, local police on a per level basis will actually give you the best uh, minus to state penalties from turmoil, but very often you're gonna wanna get off of it because you're trying to disempower the landowners. Uh, but I could see someone making an argument for this. However, this will be capped at level three. You cannot actually get to level five with local police force. Uh, for dedicated and militarized police, you can give it to level five because the law will give you plus two max law enforcement institution investment, which will allow you to get to minus 75% state penalties from turmoil if you pay for two more institutions levels relative to local police force. Uh, but maybe there's some spots where local police force makes sense because it is giving the most per level. It's giving 20% to level uh, instead of 15% per level. Now, this also gives minus radicals from standard living decreases, which is a nice modifier. I think you can make a somewhat of an argument for militarized police force. And my sample size with playing on it is small, but in here you will be getting a bonus uh, in terms of minus radicals from discrimination. So that's something. However, you will give be getting plus 2% mortality per turmoil. So at 50 turmoil plus 100% mortality, um, you know, really, really, uh, I think that I think that this modifier is pretty bad and is not worth the trade-off. You'll also be getting plus armed forces political strength. So maybe in a run where you're specifically trying to empower the armed forces, going militarized police force will make a lot of sense. Um, you know, or if you're just trying to make sure you have the bonus, something like this, because they do look very similar to each other. And 
overall, I think dedicated police force is going to be best, but you can make some arguments for militarized police force, and in some contexts, I think it will be better, um, you know, than, than dedicated. You also get it very, very late uh, if you require mass surveillance in order to get it, which is a tier 5 tech, which is just something that is worth noting. All right, so next up, we're going to talk about schooling, but I think but in order to talk about that, we have to talk about the fact that you get a free, as a result of laws and base value, 2% wealth education access. And this is very important to emphasize and note because this means that pops that have a lot of wealth will tend to get to 100% literacy anyways. Uh, and so kind of coming back and looking at the actual laws themselves, um, we will see that, uh, you know, no schools, you save money on the institution, you don't want to do this. Then we have religious schools and public schools uh, to compare, where both of these are giving 10% per, uh, flat education access. Uh, religious schools are giving you conversion and devout political strength and public schools are giving you assimilation now these modifiers are roughly speaking the same uh, because assimilation only works on pops that you already accept in which case it doesn't really make a very substantive difference other than reducing lag in game because you already uh, accept the pop assimilating it is generally not going to be too useful. I guess it helps if you are trying to empower the petite bourgeoisie because those have to be primary culture. And so this will turn accepted pops into primary culture. There's something like this, but for the most part, you can kind of think as these being interchangeable, whether or not you want the devout to have political strength. I think in most runs, the answer to this is that you don't want them to have political strength. But if you do, if you do, then religious schools can make a lot of sense. They will also give plus 100% conversion at max level, um, which if you are going to do a religious run can make sense. You can convert pops that are not your uh, accepted religion. And so this is one way in which discrimination on the basis of like ethnicity versus religion is a little bit different um, because you can uh, you can solely convert people. One of the problems is though uh, with religions is if we are trying to conquer like Qing and use uh, or tr conquer states off of Qing and use them as a battery, one aspect of religion is you can only convert pops to your religion if there is already some of them present already in the state. There has to be a non-zero amount present. And so if we were trying to, you know, bring them over from Qing, we would really need them to be the correct religion or we would need to find a way to bring some amount of pops over to our Qing province if we conquered it, like we have this here, we have this here we would need to somehow seed our religion here uh, in the state, which to be fair, we do have some Catholics here. And a lot of these Catholics, I'm guessing, will be uh, North Italian. So um, there is that, and so this would allow us to start converting pops over to Italian. But um, that's a little bit of a digression here. So generally speaking, I think public schools will be better than religious schools, but there's gonna be a lot of context where it's different. And then we have private schools, which private schools give you 2.5% wealth education access. Now, this is means that the amount that you're getting free is equivalent to four levels of private schools. But the thing is, is the pops that are really going to have enough wealth uh, to really benefit from this, they're already going to be at 100% anyways, because or relative to public schools, because if you're getting 50% from public schools, then and you're getting 2% per wealth, anyone over 25 wealth is going to have 100% education access. Uh, and the pops, and so this means people with 26 wealth, 27 wealth, 28 wealth, all of these like really, really rich guys are not going to actually get enough from this because they're already gonna be capped out. You do have the intelligentsia political strength. This is a little bit of a thing, but the pops you really care about, uh, they're gaining access to more education is going to be the lower strata pops and just having 4.5% wealth education access because we're getting it from um, just base values as well is not gonna be as good for bringing those guys up as is going to be having public schools or religious schools. So for that reason, we think public schools is best, but religions, religious schools is functionally very similar. It just depends on the nature of the run. All right, so health system has been enormously buffed in 1.5, and public health insurance is just considerably better than the other two, so we're actually just gonna kind of do this in reverse. Uh, in here, we will be getting 2.5 standard living for everybody, we will be getting minus 75% pollution effects reduction and minus 20% mortality. Uh, relative to the other two, let's take a look. So we have uh, 2.5 standard of living. This gives 2.5 standard of living, but only to the upper strata. This is gonna be the strata that is going to, uh, 
it's uh, not going to affect your average SOL that much because there uh, are going to be a lot less of them. So this will not pull up your SOL very much at all, which is one of the really strong effects of public health insurance is it allows you to pull a lot more migrants. Um, uh, uh, charity hospitals will give you plus 2.5 standard of living for the lower strata only, which to be fair is more valuable than the upper strata one, but you'd rather just have it on everyone because this will also cover the middle class. You get minus 75 for a pollution effects reduction. Now on each of these, uh, let's kind of just take a look at what the pollution is at max level. So this is Lazio, it's pretty built up and it only has 80%. So we're not talking like we're gonna reach max level everywhere, but max level will give minus 10% uh, migration attraction. So the marginal difference, if there's 25% difference on each of these, is gonna be 2.5% migration attraction at max level, 0.75% uh, uh, or 0.75 uh, standard of living at max level, and this is applied to everywhere, so it's really even more standard of living, and then also 12.5% mortality in terms of the differential, because these will be able to, private and, uh, Private health insurance and charity hospitals will be able to reduce the effects of pollution by 50%. Public health insurance is reducing it by 50. So that's even more SOL for you. And then minus 20% flat mortality. Uh, charity hospitals gives minus 15%, so strictly worse. And this will give minus mortality per wealth. And so there's maybe a scenario where you get to like high enough wealth that this is going to uh, be a bigger uh, like thing on mortality. But you have to remember, this has to come up to at least... Uh, uh, you're gonna have the increased mortality from the pollution, right? Uh, and so th whatever this is, it has to override it. So in places with no pollution, right, you have to have at least 20, or sorry, so this is just minus, uh, oops, that's the wrong tab. This is just minus 20% mortality. So this means you're gonna need a wealth level of 20 in order to have the same mortality per wealth. But in max, uh, it's going to be 32 and mortality is generally going to negatively affect the lower run pops more uh, and so uh just overall public health insurance is just gonna look considerably better than the other two. You would need a very, very strange scenario, like maybe we're reaching this type of thing, this type of scenario where our lower strata has 21, uh, you know, kind of wealth level and our upper, our middle strata is 26 because we've gone communist, where maybe like wealth, wealth would make some sense, but we'd have to get this up to 32 somehow. Uh, it's this being this level here, or at least the average between these two up to 32, uh, which the average is going to be two thirds of this and one third of this. It's not going to move the needle at this point. And so for the most part, public health insurance will be your go-to. And very often, and this is kind of something that's key and important to remember, the devout will support it, which means you do not want to marginalize the devout until after you've gotten it. This is very, very important play pattern at 1.2. Do not marginalize the devout until you've gotten public health insurance because otherwise you're gonna have to wait for the trade unionists to be able to do it. And this is a really, really important institution. I think that is all of them. So we're just gonna quickly run through all of these again and then do our outro here. So for the economic system, I think laissez-faire is best early game and the cooperative ownership is best late game once you've passed, you know, maybe 800, uh, 800 to 1.2 billion GDP is maybe where you want to make the swap to cooperative ownership. Uh, for trade policy, I think free trade is the best, and get, unless you are like the world's market, in which case isolationism becomes better. But important to note, there is an ownership difference, and mercantilism is going to be worse than protectionism, uh, but you just avoid tariffing anyways. Graduated taxation is going to be best, uh, even if it doesn't always make the most money, because it is going to be targeting the pops you want to extract wealth from the most. Um, and notably, land-based taxation is going to be better for swapping on a proportional taxation, so very often you want to actively avoid per capita taxation, because it makes the swap from uh, onto proportional taxation harder you'll probably be proportional most of the game for land reform i think we're going in order here uh, i think that early on uh very very early on you're going to want to go tenant farmers over homesteading and then as soon as you can commercialized agriculture will look better and then in the hyper late game you will want collectivized agriculture uh, for colonization i think colonial exploitation will be better 
for most countries, really, really leaning on getting the extra throughput, especially in Africa, applying to the rubber and the wood. However, uh, I think colonial resettlement is going to be nice if you have a lot of states, like if you're playing the USA, that are unincorporated and have a lot of flat migration attraction modifier from unused arable land. This plus 50% modifier is going to be quite strong for pulling, uh, you know, from various places in your market and is something worth considering. And also, if you're playing a country like Qing, which is going to have a lot of pops that are ending up unemployed just being able to siphon out of those uh out of your core territories those extra pops uh so that they won't be unemployed they will work in the subsistence farms they will provide labor to the new places i think it'll have a lot of value in those kind of contexts for policing, I think dedicated police force is best, but it's a little bit close. You can make an argument for militarized police force. I think that this mortality is not worth it. Um, and then local police force is going to provide the most per level. Uh, I think public schools is going to be best, but religious schools is functionally very similar. Uh, private schools, you generally don't want to go. And then I think public health insurance is going to be best. I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. If you did, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe, do the YouTube algorithm thing. And other than that, have a good one.